Well, hello and welcome uh, who, for the people who are joining. Uh, welcome to the second week of this Python for STEM um, lecture series. Today, um, I'm going to be passing uh, the lectures to Joe Carpi. He's going to join in a second. Uh, here he is. Hi. <laughs> Uh, Joe Carpi, he's a postdoc, a postdoctoral researcher at Jefferson Lab. He was a PhD student at William & Mary. He graduated, he moved as a, as a postdoc to Columbia University in New York. And he's now back at uh, JLab working on computational problems for nuclear and subatomic physics in Lattice QCD. Uh, he will be taking the lead of the lectures for today and the one in on Friday, right? Yeah. And um, so thanks everybody for joining. And we will begin uh, in, in a second. Let's just uh, let some people um, join. And if you already have any questions about anything, any of the things that we did last week, uh, you can use the Q&A um, as, as usual. So you can put your questions in the Q&A, or if you want to use the chat, we're going to use the chat as well. Well, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, should we wait just another minute or two for people to file in? Trickle in. Uh, yes. Thank you, Felipe, for uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you for uh, Philip and Jeff. And um, I don't think I got the name of the other uh, person at support, but thank you guys for helping uh, make all this run smoothly. Uh, fortunately, this seems, seems like quite a nice program to be a part of. And I'm happy to give two lectures. Uh, perhaps if our uh, number of attendees is flat towing, we should uh, begin. What do you think? <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you. Get in here. So uh, I was asked to talk today about um, <clears throat> ultimately some of the applications of using computational science to uh, projectile motion. And uh, projectile motion is sort of an old problem, understanding uh, Newton's laws of motion, uh, as uh, well as included with gravity. And if you'll give me a second as I introduce, I'm going to put on my headphones, not the face gun. Uh, and so I hope to give uh, first a bit of an introduction of how computational physics gets used to solve uh, range of problems, including uh, modern applications towards the usage of around gravity. And then I wanted to begin setting us up, uh, understanding some of the tools that were used uh, last week, uh, as Felipe gave some of the basic examples, uh, that, and some of the tools that were used to uh, help visualize some of the results of how our particles are moving, and how we would use Python to make uh, plots to help represent some of the uh, more complicated information we wanted to do, and generally this idea of visualization. And then uh, lead into Friday, where we would actually begin to solve some of these uh, basic physics problems of how do I predict where will a projectile, a ball, a rocket, something will, where it'll go into the future. So uh, to begin, um, <clears throat> let me at least highlight the fact that in uh, contemporary STEM, there is a large number of applications uh, where computers are uh, necessary and fundamental to the way that we do things. So uh, naturally, we think of computers as computational systems. The first thing we ever really want to do with computers, the thing that you would do on a, a handheld calculator as you're beginning to learn mathematics, which is uh, you want to multiply, add numbers, do some of these things that are simply just uh, difficult to do by hand, uh, where a computer could do them quite rapidly. And this is something which is a, a huge piece of the uh, kind of work which Felipe and I engage in in Lattice QCD, where we just have millions of numbers that must be multiplied together and added together in specific ways to tell us about physics. Moreover, there are other places, a very important one in the modern world is data science becoming more and more uh, important. As we gain new data, new information about the world around us, we want to uh, understand hypotheses, like what caused certain effects. And so data science is a huge field, which is now booming with the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques where you end up requiring massive computations to be performed because you have huge data sets and very complicated models understanding them. 
Uh, other places which are uh, <clears throat> and not unrelated to the uh, application of projectile motion, which uh, we will be getting into uh, in these two lectures, are uh, simulations. One can imagine that you wish to say, given some initial set of conditions, what happens into the future? Now, there are very many uh, very important applications here. For, for example, one of uh, another fellow graduate student of Felipe and me who went to William & Mary now works for NASA who helping predict where will hurricanes go in the future. We know uh, this time of year, uh, there begins to be hurricanes forming off the coast of Africa and moving their way across the Atlantic. And understanding where these can go can be critical in trying to help uh, people to get ready and end up saving lives. And also, if you wish to say, uh, become a designer, you wish to build bridges, you may wish to make sure that your bridge doesn't move after you built it. Uh, for example, you don't want it to fall over. You could build the bridge and see it fall over and have learned something and wasted a lot of time, or you could perform computer simulations where the computer can tell you what will happen in the future, as opposed to building it yourself. Again, as I mentioned, uh, visualization, which is an incredibly important one for science and for uh, education generally, where you're trying to present complex ideas, where sometimes words uh, being said aloud or written on paper are just insufficient to really uh, get the message across. So being able to uh, use a computer to generate both interesting graphics such as art, or uh, being able to uh, <clears throat> actually use it in order to present complicated information is quite an important tool. And finally, the field of machine learning has uh, grown quite dramatically in the past five, uh, 10 years or so. And that's because machine learning algorithms uh, do something very fundamental. They are, are attempting to understand functions, which are, of course, at the heart of uh, computer uh, uh, implementations. We will be defining functions throughout our work. And these functions are something simply that uh, it takes in an input and it gives you an output. For example, Google might want to know the function uh, does this image contain a cat? The input would be an image. It would be some uh, digital version of each of the pixels in your image with each of the different colors that appear there. And the output would be the probability that that image had a cat. This is a quite complicated function that uh, without other things like machine learning tools, I wouldn't really know how to define or write down in terms of all of our other normal functions like sines and cosines and so on. Uh, another uh, quite popular machine learning uh, application now is ChatGPT, and the basis behind that sort of natural language machine learning uh, tool is to understand the question, given a prompt, given some input, what are the best words, series of words, the next word to say that should uh, respond to that question? This is an incredibly complicated function, but it is still just any function one might uh, be able to uh, attempt to calculate. And when you're trying to go through your different applications that you'll encounter as future engineers, scientists, and whatever other uh, STEM fields you're interested in, uh, you'll be given very diff many different kinds of problems. And they might fall into some of these categories, and who knows uh, where other types of problems may come in the future. And uh, part of the, uh, and at the core of doing computational science is trying to understand how can you both understand your problem and how can you make a efficient and uh, proper way that your computer can also understand this problem? And it requires uh, quite a deal of insight, both into the actual problem you're trying to understand, some feature about the world, some nature about your bridges you're building. And it also requires a great deal of uh, understanding of how to go through programming and how to speak with computers and what things are possible with modern computers, what things were possible with computers in the 60s and what things might be possible in the computers in the 2060s. And uh, being able to bring all these ideas together is uh, quite a complicated task, which requires a lot of practice dealing with computer problems. And hopefully through this lecture series, you have been learning, uh, gaining some practice and at least learning different ways to solve different problems. Now, um, <clears throat> the problem of projectile motion is quite a uh, old one, which uh, at least mathematically dates all the way back to Isaac Newton and his laws of motion. The idea is simply uh, attempting to understand a, a very basic question. When an object is subject to forces, how is its movement change? And a lot of physics questions involve this question of how do things change? And uh, if we want to understand uh, how, say, a cannonball being shot out of a cannon, as Isaac Newton would attempt to describe, 
we would need to understand how the forces are applied and then what happens after the forces are applied and where will it move. And the great triumph of uh, the second laws of motion was the ability to apply it to gravity, uh, I would say, which was uh, one of Newton's other great discoveries was the law of gravity. And as we'll see, uh, that application in certain cases are quite simple and you get beautiful answers and you can write down lovely formula and pen and paper. But as soon as you want to have more complicated problems, the ability to do these solutions on pen and paper breaks down. And it turns out that uh, many applications will require computers to understand. So uh, let's break down Newton's second law of motion here, which is described by this lovely formula. Uh, uh, let me begin by saying this uncomfortable symbol here is a derivative, which I believe uh, next week you will be uh, learning about calculus and how calculus is handled uh, computationally. But uh, for now, this uh, fraction here, the important piece is it describes how motion is changing. It is the acceleration of the object that you have under study. And if you don't know what acceleration is, um, you can imagine uh, the changing of velocities as if you were to begin walking and then jogging and then running, you're going uh, first slowly walking and then faster and faster to jogging and running. And the rate at which you go from walking to jogging to running is your acceleration. If you take a whole minute to go and speed up, that is a very slow acceleration. Or if you begin running very quickly, that is going to be a rapid acceleration, a large uh, number for this ratio. The uh, M here is the mass of the particle. So the mass of the particle depends on how, and, or determines how much the uh, force will actually accelerate the thing itself. And on the right-hand side is the sum of all forces. So one can imagine that if I have a ball that is uh, flying through the air, it's being pulled downwards by gravity, for example. Maybe it's being pushed backwards uh, due to air resistance, causing a force to slow down the motion. Or if you imagine you wanted to uh, study complicated systems under gravity, which have more than just the Earth pulling it down, but the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and so on, you could still use Newton's second law of motion to describe it. Uh, but this is where the problem comes in. If you deal with uh, two-body systems, such as if you just consider the Earth and the Moon, or a ball being pulled down by gravity after it was kicked, or you consider the planets orbiting around the Sun, you get uh, beautiful mathematical results that uh, have nice, uh, they, they say the planet will move around in an elliptical orbit, just as Kepler had observed uh, prior to Newton writing down his laws, and everything looks quite nice. But unfortunately, when we look into the solar system, we see more than just the sun and one planet. Perhaps we want to understand how does Jupiter affect Earth's orbit around the sun. So we wish to study Jupiter, Earth, and the sun all together, a three-body system. At this point, as soon as you have two forces pulling on the Earth, Jupiter and the sun, the ability to write down nice, simple solutions are uh, completely lost. There are only a few known solutions to this so-called three-body problem. And you imagine the solar system, which is full of, some solar systems have multiple stars, many planets. We now have dwarf planets, uh, unfortunately for Pluto, and all of the other things that are moving around uh, in our solar system that all might want to be handled together simultaneously. Um, in uh, this book by Lu Shishin uh, called The Three-Body Problem, or at least here the uh, English translation of it, uh, there are characters who are playing a video game and they use the non-player characters in the video game to form a rudimentary computer to understand these problems. And so this uh, gives a nice funny image of how does a computer work if you imagine instead of complicated transistors and gates, you imagine a person there holding a flag up on one side or the other side, depending on which way it's supposed to be going. Uh, but in order to solve many of these complicated problems, we need these complicated computers. And in the 1960s, we in the US were building up the Apollo program and attempting to send uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins to the moon. And this was an incredible problem, which required doing these sort of orbital mechanics calculations where you have to care about the gravity of Earth and the gravity of the moon pulling on the rocket all at once. And here you see a, a famous photo of Margaret Hamilton uh, standing in front of the software that was run on the flight computer. So back in the 1960s, this is how code would have been written up and reviewed is in literal book form being passed around. And as you can see, uh, the amount of code required to get people to and from the moon is quite substantial, uh, especially in the way it was written back in the day. Uh, and 
<clears throat> now uh, we no longer print out our code in this ways, but instead everything gets uploaded to uh, GitHub. So the MIT historians have taken these uh, nice texts and transcribed them. So you can see what it took to take uh, the uh, command module, lunar module, and to actually run them as part of the Apollo missions if you go to this uh, GitHub repo. Now, if rocket science is not a complicated enough application of computational science to gravity, uh, things unfortunately get much worse uh, if you wish to study the true intricacies of gravity as uh, explained by Einstein, which is encapsulated into general relativity. Here we have a very uh, famous picture, which uh, the creation of itself was an intense computational problem of the black hole at the center of uh, Messier 87, a, a distant galaxy. And now they begin uh, constructing other images of this such. Uh, general relativity is a quite uh, complex theory of gravity, which describes uh, the interactions as folding space and time itself. And this theory has a lot of very interesting predictions, which um, have helped give us a lot of confidence in it because we see these things uh, when we not never would have imagined them being there before. For example, black holes, the uh, idea that there is so where something so massive light cannot escape. Or when two black holes collide together, they create a wave of gravitational uh, fields propagating out, which are now being detected by the LIGO detectors. Uh, there exists other uh, experimental observations. One of the early uh, applications was to understand the so-called precession of Mercury's perihelion. Uh, as Mercury comes to the closest point in its orbit to the sun, the perihelion, where this point in actually moves in space, unlike what it does for Earth and for uh, Venus or any of the other planets, because Mercury is so close to the sun, general relativity affects it and can accurately predict to this particular observable. And finally, there's this idea of gravitational lensing. There, there's being able to see behind distant galaxies. And this is one of the things that allows us to understand uh, the nature of dark matter. Now, an important piece of uh, understanding what we see out in the universe and what gravitational waves come into our LIGO detectors, we wish to do simulations of when two black holes hit each other, what happens. And uh, you can find at this YouTube link, a nice video uh, from a group at NASA doing exactly this, where they're attempting to use uh, computational simulations in order to show what sort of things we might expect if two black holes merged and how that might appear in our detectors. But moreover than simulation, uh, there is an image problem, which is the generation of this image. Uh, where it came from was the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, which is really many telescopes all across the world studying the same uh, region in Messier 87 and uh, compiling huge amounts of data. But this data is not this exact image, but it's instead some complicated convolution of this image. And it is uh, it forms a mathematical problem, which is called the ill-posed image inverse problem, which is a bunch of complicated jargon. And uh, essentially, what does it mean is that there was some 2D image. There was a black hole there, and it has some light coming from it. Which is the most probable 2D image? What's the most probable picture that gave us that data that we observed? Now, the Event Horizon Telescope generated five petabytes of data. Now, if you remember your uh, metric units, uh, usually when we uh, measure bytes, it's in uh, gigabytes or megabytes. Uh, mega goes for millions and giga goes for billions of bytes. Uh, terabytes are the next step. So that would be uh, trillions of bytes. Petabytes are one more than that. So the hard drive in my computer I'm on right now is a one terabyte hard drive. And that's how much it can possibly store, and it would require 5,000 of them in order to store all the data generated by the Event Horizon Telescope. And then somehow that data is inverted in order to create this image. And Katie Bowman here is one of the uh, computational scientists who have been working on this problem, standing in front of one chunk of the data set that was sent. Uh, the data that they generated was so massive that it was faster not to send it over the internet as we normally would, but to literally fly suitcases of it. So this is presumably one suitcase full of hard drives being shipped out of many uh, such trips. Now, uh, imagery construction is a problem that exists in a lot of places. Uh, here is an example of imagery construction, which is a uh, lovely computational uh, issue uh, being applied to an MRI image of a human heart. 
So on the left here is the actual image that was, uh, if you were to naively and directly reconstruct what the uh, magnetic resonance imager was telling you, you would get this with all these funny features. These lines we don't believe actually exist within it, inside of human. There aren't just straight lines shooting out in various directions. But these seem to be artifacts of some feature that was actually there. So uh, somehow image information was lost and some in and some uh, information was added that contaminates this image. And so the idea of image reconstruction is how can we clean up this blurry image? And through some uh, method, uh, which you can see described here at Wikipedia, where I got this image from, you can see that ultimately they're able to clean up the image in, via these methods. And similar ones were the same idea of what was needed to clean up that black hole image. Now in particle physics, uh, which is something that of course exists here at Jefferson Lab, uh, we have a similar problem of image reconstruction, where we have two particles colliding, and we know that they have, according to Newton's laws, which will be important for us to understand when we want to do projectile motion, but there are certain things that are conserved, momentum and energy, but when we slam things together, we might not know exactly what we hit when they are of a type such as protons, or generally called hadrons. So at the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, they uh, smash protons together. But protons themselves are made up of smaller particles. They're made up of so-called quarks and gluons. So one might ask a reasonable question, when my two protons hit each other, uh, what actually hit each other? Did two quarks hit each other? Or did two gluons bounce each other off? And what created the events that we see coming out? So for Higgs production at the LHC, when they smash two protons together, there might be, a, for example, here in the CMS detector, uh, two photons that were shot out in uh, particular angles. And this we would be able to infer uh, was the production of a Higgs boson. And similarly, at the Atlas detector, uh, these red lines would be muons, a uh, different subatomic particle shooting out in their various directions. And somehow we must infer from our, our what we know, which is our outcoming particles, these uh, green lines and blue red lines, whatever they were, we must infer what actually happened. So if we were to uh, consider uh, Jefferson Lab's experiment called uh, deep inelastic scattering, where we shoot an electron at a proton, our proton is really a cloud of things. And we know we hit something. Here I uh, show a quark at being struck by a photon, which came from our incoming electron. And we might want to understand uh, where was that quark? Was the quark near the middle? Was it far out? And was it moving uh, mostly in the direction of the proton or is it moving somewhere else in the other directions? But unfortunately, much of this information is lost to us in our experiment. And so we will uh, be hoping to uh, be able to use these image reconstruction techniques to be able to invert and get a full 3D image of our proton. Today, we know very high precision what our proton's distribution looks like in the direction of motion, which is what this picture is representing telling us, well, in this particular uh, fraction of momenta, we have a lot of up quarks and down quarks, where over here we happen to have a lot of gluons instead. Uh, and one of the goals of the new collider, uh, which is going to be built at uh, Brookhaven National Lab, is to improve this picture, that we can now know these transverse uh, degrees of freedom. What is our real 3D image of our proton? And so this electron ion collider will collide uh, electrons with not just protons, but also other various atomic nuclei in order to probe what do the images of these things actually look like. Now, um, there is a, a final piece of uh, particle physics that I wish to describe, which is another uh, very different way in which computers can be used within STEM, which is to solve uh, calculus and algebra for us. One, uh, within particle physics, we like to use so-called Feynman diagrams, which is a nice, uh, lovely little picture here, which describes a very complicated and very difficult to do integral. So this is sort of a, uh, a pioneering championship version of what visualization is. This nice little picture actually is, represents this whole terrible, terrible integral. And you can imagine that a human trying to derive this uh, formula would make a mistake they would lose the 149 over here and write the wrong number there or something. Like this is an incredibly complicated problem to have to handle. So instead there are computer softwares like Mathematica or Maple, which allow you to handle algebra and understand these fundamental theoretical processes that are occurring. 
And ultimately, we will like to be able to <clears throat> combine these theoretical pieces with the understanding of what actually went on in our particle accelerator to be able to uh, invert this image and understand what does a proton look like. So uh, that went, uh, that was at least uh, hoping to be a little bit of background here. So I'm going to uh, pause for a moment for questions and give you an idea of what is gonna come up next. I hope to give a little bit of review of some of the basic Python things that you learned last week. And then I'm gonna get into some examples of how do you actually begin plotting the data that we will want to be uh, hopefully describing our projectile motion. And I will uh, at least establish the math problem that we want to be handling uh, on Friday. So uh, let me pause here. And uh, if there are any uh, questions or anything that uh, anyone would like to ask about this sort of overview of computational physics uh, that's going on, both here at Jefferson Lab and around at other facilities. Well, I uh, suppose if there are no uh, questions about this, we can get into the actual Python now. Uh, and please uh, feel free to use this Q&A uh, thing to send in questions and hopefully uh, Philip or I will notice. Let me move on. Uh, <clears throat> so now uh, a quick reminder of some basic things in uh, Python. Uh, to some of the things we will need to be using in uh, today's uh, examples are basic operators. We will, uh, the basic operators within Python fall into a few different categories. Uh, the main ones we will want is this lovely equal sign, the assignment operator. This is how you define new variables. So you say I have on the left-hand side, a variable whose name I wrote down and I care about. And on the right-hand side, you say the expression. Maybe you want it to be equal to a number, or maybe it's equal to some algebra that occurs, or maybe it's equal to some numpy arrays. And if you wish, you can compare values uh, with the equal signs, not equal to, less than greater, and so on. Now, uh, we will also need to be able to define functions. So functions, as we said, we're uh, going to first, you have to write def to tell Python you want to write the name of a function. Then you would give it the name itself and uh, what its arguments are, because functions typically have inputs. And it will do some manipulation of the variables you define here and ultimately return one. This is the output of our function. And this simple formula here will convert uh, temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit because the difference is uh, nine fifths plus 32. And for our actual examples of the Python, which uh, notebooks, which you'll be seeing, which I uh, will be able to pull up next to here in just a moment is uh, first let us remind ourselves how to set up the functions we wish to be plotting today. Uh, the first thing we need to do when we run is that we need to pull up the libraries that we want to be plotting. Uh, matplotlib and its module pyplot uh, is a very useful uh, library for being able to create all sorts of different images, which is what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, and numpy or uh, numpy, however you wish to say it, <laughs> which we uh, shorten here as np, is this library that contains all of our ability to make nice arrays and do linear algebra and be able to call uh, very special math functions, which we will be needing in the near future. Uh, in the next line, we're going to begin creating arrays, if we remind ourselves. If we wish to create an array, which is a range of numbers uh, from a start to an end, uh, you use the a range function. So a range will send out an array which goes from a start here of zero to the value of two, but two is not included. The stop is not included in many uh, Python applications. And it will step by intervals of whatever the second number is. So X will make a grid from zero to two, stepping by every 0 0.01. And uh, X1 will be a coarser grid, which will step by uh, intervals of 0 0.1. And then finally, we are going to, uh, well, first uh, print out the values so you can see what they are. Uh, so we're gonna call the print function, which will print out uh, first these lines of stars and then we'll print out the values of X. And then uh, at the bottom, we are gonna define our functions again here. Here the uh, pow function is the same as the exponential. It, it'll take X to the bth power. So the functions we're gonna be plotting are X to the uh, one and a half power and X to the second power. 
And uh, we're going to be using this matplotlib and pyplot to make a uh, series of various different uh, charts and plots and information that we wish to uh, be able to present. And uh, over here is the simplest example, which I will work through in just a moment, We're actually running the Jupyter Notebook. And the goal of making one of these basic plots, which this plot is simply a line plot, is that you want to first uh, prepare whatever data it is, just as we did on the previous slide. And you're going to tell it a x value, a y value, which will be our functions, and then some formatting things that will make your plots look nice and pretty. And then you will change the uh, limits and ranges and things that will make your uh, plot show the data in the uh, values that you wish to understand. So uh, what does all that mean? Let me go back to my uh, notebook here. Let me restart my kernel. So I will walk through uh, each of these comments, hitting shift enter. Uh, so OK, it loads the libraries. We created the arrays. And now if I were to print them out, we see X, as I mentioned, was going from 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 .02, all the way up to 2. X1 does the same, but in a finer grid. And now depth F1, we are defining our functions again. Now, when we're doing uh, pi plots, you have the ability to use subplots, which will allow you to put multiple plots on top of each other in the same figure. So this cell, I'm going to jump ahead and show you what we will actually be plotting before I actually walk you through it. It will make these three images and put them into the so-called subplots. So plot A will be showing in uh, red the x to the 1.5 power, and in blue, x to the 2 power. These were our f1 and f2 functions. In plot 2, it shows how you can change the formatting and add in boxes as part of the way the plots are done. And in plot three, it shows how you can add an error box to your plots, because obviously uh, nothing within science is done exactly. Everything comes with errors. We have no exact perfect information. And so uh, by showing these error bars, you are showing the inaccuracy of that information. Uh, I see a question here. Uh, a range does work like Linspace. I believe Linspace is the Python pre-built in, where a range is the numpy version of it. Is that correct, Philip? I see you're uh, typing the answer. Yeah, I think um, with Linspace, you just um, tell it how many points you want, and it separates them linearly. And with um, A range, you just tell them tell it the step instead of ah. the number of points. Thank you. Yes. Okay. That was the difference, right? You tell it how many numbers you want versus uh, the step size. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yes, they are very uh, similar functions. They give you very similar information. Yeah. So it's a reasonable uh, thing to make a difference between. All right, good. <clears throat> okay, so let's focus on plot A again. So uh, we made plot A by beginning with uh, saying pi plot is PLT, uh, subplot 311. You'll see the others are 312 and 313. These uh, integers are telling it how to make the plots. It's saying there will be three rows, one column, and this is the first entry. And then this is also doing three rows, one column. This is the second entry, three rows, one column, and the third entry. So that's why each of those three subplots are giving you plot one, two, and three. Now, uh, one thing you might want to do with your plots is give it a lovely title, uh, which you can see in the final figure. And calling a pi plot plot, this simple plot function, will give you a nice line graph. It takes in the x value. It takes in the y value, which is the f1 of x here. And uh, here, you tell it to choose a color. You, uh, and Python loves these so-called keyword arguments, where you'll see here there are keywords set equal to various uh, other things. And so this is a way that you pass in complicated information into the Python functions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So plot takes in very many, which we can work through uh, here, but one of which is color. And we choose to make the first one red, the second one blue. And we choose to change the x limits of the plot, so the minimum x we see and the maximum x value we see. And this is how we reproduce this plot. And by calling plot multiple times, you're plotting onto the same subfig. Now, if we go to the next one, um, here we're calling a plot again in the same manner to make the red line, uh, which is underscoring here, is the function f1. And here, actually, we should have just called plot, but it's fun. 
uh, if we want to use the error bar function, it acts very similar. If you only give two arguments to error bar, it'll plot just like plot does. If you give three arguments to error bars, it'll add the error bars, as I said. So that's the difference between the error bar function and the plot function. Now, if you wish to change your uh, format of your plots, for example, I don't want it to be a line. Instead, I want it to have squares, or I, mean, I want the squares to be of a certain size. Uh, these are other potential options that you can set. And so that is what shows for these points here to be listed in squares of this particular size. And if I were to change marker size, the squares would get, uh, let's say, smaller. Nope, nope, sorry. I did not run all of the things. This one first, now that one. Good. There we go. Now the squares are smaller uh, because I changed the marker size. Um, and the marker filling uh, is set to be white. So they are white uh, here in the circles or in the squares inside. And uh, I believe this is the boundary color as well. So by adding new keyword arguments, uh, you can uh, change what the actual functionality of the plots are. So in subplot three, we instead make some of these, uh, instead are plotting now with a circle instead of a square, and we added in an error bar term. Now, one thing to be careful when plotting uh, important information where you care about the error bars is this uh, marker size. So if I were to tell you there are error bars over here, but you can't see them behind the marker. So this is not a good way to plot this data. And as you uh, begin to generate new data and want to make plots and understanding of these uh, features, you would like to uh, study and remake these plots and make sure you can present all of the necessary information in them. Uh, sorry, let me see if I can more. Uh, ah, yes, thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry, I haven't uploaded this. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't uploaded this file yet. Uh, um, the uh, FMT, I saw in one of those comments, uh, FMT stands for formatting. So it's telling it uh, to do things like plot with circles or plot with squares. Um, and these are other ones, which uh, I believe I have somewhere in here, a link to the website where we can look up and find what all of these uh, arguments are, which I may not remember, uh, but I will hopefully you can do these in your own time. Uh, this white one is turning the center of the marker faces to be white. So if I turn this to be red, I believe, we will see the fill of the inner plots here. Uh, they're red circles on the inside now, as opposed to white circles. Um, so all of these are just about changing colors and formats and making your plots look nice and presentable so that your uh, information can be shared concisely. All right. Uh, the next things that are done in this particular cell is after we make all these plots with our titles and our uh, proper limits, uh, it calls two more functions. Tight layout uh, is just a way of making sure that the plots aren't overlapping. Sometimes by plot is not perfect. Text will be overlapping other texts. So uh, there are a few auxiliary functions like this tight layout, which will help you uh, correct for that. Uh, in a future example, I'll show you can add in some arguments here, which will tell it to uh, make the plots more spread apart or less spread apart than they already were. And finally, uh, one of the most important functions is save fig. Uh, having your information and your plots on your own Jupyter notebook is nice, but you need to be able to share them with other people, of course. And that's what save fig does. Uh, if you run this, it will create a file, example plot.pdf, which will contain this image and however it was. And uh, these uh, arguments are telling it, how does it handle the white space in this image? So there's some white space in the thing existing outside and in between the plots, which these are telling it, what is it doing for, as far as the image is concerned. So uh, before I move on, excuse me, are there any other questions on this basic plotting lines in the line plots here? All right. Uh, then we're going to go on to a, uh, <clears throat> oh, wait, sorry, there are a couple more examples. If we wish to do uh, more complicated functions, uh, one can imagine, uh, here we wish to calculate exponentials. So this is an example of a function which is uh, decaying exponentially. This would be like if I had a radioactive particle, and over time, some of them would decay into some other things, and how many are left after a certain amount of time, uh, this sort of exponential would go. And uh, the rate, the half-life of that radioactive particle would determine what number goes here. And 2.1 was just the choice. 
Another example of a exponential function, which is relevant is uh, the uh, heat exchange. So uh, how does the temperature of an object uh, change as it is being heated? This happens to go like the exponential of the square. Uh, so this is another interesting function one can imagine wanting to plot. So a few more uh, possibilities of how you might want to uh, format <coughs> the figures is uh, perhaps you see this figure and you say, this is a little too small. I don't like how compressed it is in this direction. You can call at the beginning before you start making figures, pyplot.figure. Uh, and this just tells PyPlot you want to start making a figure with certain information, such as the fig size. These uh, five or 10 and five will ultimately tell the figures to be much larger, as you can see here, than what we were getting before by just calling the subplot initially. So for these new uh, different things we want to plot, we again call subplot, where we now want one row and uh, two columns, as you can see down here. And we're going to call the first one. We're gonna set the limits again, not just of the X direction of our plot, but change the Y direction limits as well. We add a table just as before. And here we call plot in a different manner. We actually plot both curves we're interested in in one call. If you remember before we called uh, in this example, plt.plot and plt.plot twice. You could have done it uh, all in one line uh, in this manner, but uh, you can no longer pass the keyword arguments in the same way. So this uh, B0, BO would have been the same as having told it before, uh, color equals B and F and T equals O. <clears throat> and so by simply telling it uh, BO, it learns this. Or instead, K, I believe, stands for black plots. So if we were to look at the first figure in our uh, rows here, we will see it has both of these curves. So we have, have the one curve in black and the one which was blue circles. And the particular limits of the y-axis and x-axis are what we set with a y-lim and x-lim. Uh, on this. All right, good. And now if we were to <clears throat> instead want to make the second plot in the similar manner, we can call our single plot and uh, give it a formatting option like this. Uh, R stands for red. So let me write this again. R equals red. And dash dash means a uh, dashed line. So if we go down and look at our plot, it is in red and it's got dashed lines. There are other options you could have put instead. Maybe I believe a uh, dash dot does dash dot lines. <laughs> so here you say dash dot lines instead of dashed lines as this formatting option. And again, you can add labels and you can uh, for the X and Y axes as you might wish. And ultimately, that is how we get these figures. Again, here we called the tight layout uh, call. But if we had called it without all of these options, so let me uh, comment these away, you'll see the figures are now uh, closer together than they were. So these set of options are set up here to be able to pad the image, as it were. And if you uh, can find the documentation on a tight layout, it could tell you exactly how what these numbers correspond to. Uh, but it, what it, the effect is, is to spread out your image. Good, good, good. Okay. Uh, so this is all I have on regular plot. Uh, simple lines and scatter plots where we want to throw dots onto the screen. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at are Gaussian distributions. So let me go back to our notes here, and I will begin describing what a Gaussian uh, distribution is. Uh, I believe in a few weeks you will be taking a class on statistics. And uh, the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution are uh, fundamental in uh, many applications within statistics. For example, if you were to try to uh, calculate averages, the averages would be distributed uh, in this sort of random manner. So uh, a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution has a few important features that are used to define it. <clears throat> it has a mean and it has a standard deviation. And so the idea is that if I were to ask for a random number, M, it would be somewhere near the mean, and how near the mean it must be is defined by the so-called standard deviation. So if I were to plot this funny for formula, I would get a curve that looks like this. And this is the so-called bell curve, uh, which normal distributions follow. So in this case, M naught would have been zero, 
And this is showing you that 68.2% uh, of the data is between uh, M naught plus sigma and M naught minus sigma. So when we want to draw random numbers, most of them would be in this range. Some of them would be a little farther out and some even farther. But most of them will be here in the middle near these uh, mean. Now, uh, back in the day of Gauss and other, uh, or even uh, in more recent times, uh, the ability to use random numbers was quite complicated without modern computers. Even in uh, when I was a freshman in college, I was, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go with tricked into buying a book which was full of mathematical formulas, which I was told I would need. Uh, in 2010, you might uh, think was so long ago, we still had the internet. I could have Googled all of those formulas that I needed and I could have Googled random numbers. But in the back of this book was a table of just random numbers. So in uh, older times, uh, before we had a nice, easy Python to be able to generate random numbers, this is what you had to do. You had to buy a book and grab some of these tables and use maybe uh, this list of random numbers for my one calculation, or this list of random numbers for my other calculation, and somehow turn these even distributions into Gaussian distributions. On the other hand, we uh, live in 2023, I believe is the year, and we have much simpler things. If I wish to calculate from Python a uh, random number generated with a Gaussian distribution, I would ask uh, ChatGPT how to do it. Uh, so I uh, could just connect to ChatGPT. It is a thing that knows how to do machine learning. And I ask it a simple question. How do I uh, learn Gaussian random numbers from Python? And because computer programming is such a linear process, it's much easier than many of the other questions you might ask ChatGPT. And it knows exactly what to tell me to do. It tells me to call uh, NumPy and its random normal distributions. With these particular arguments, it will give me a mean of zero and a distribution of one. Or if I want 10 of them, I would put a 10 here in my second argument. So if we wished to uh, generate random numbers, this is what we must do. Now, uh, NumPy has many, many uh, random distributions that you might want to sample from, not just the normal distribution, but maybe a log normal or Poisson distributions, which are the kind that, for example, if you wish to say uh, uh, you're studying uh, human settlements, uh, villages, cities, and you're asking yourself, what is the number of people who live in each different kind? And uh, what are the odds that if I go to a random settlement that it has 1,000 people, 5,000 people, 10,000, a million people? In it? This follows a Poisson distribution, not a normal distribution. And uh, if you want any of these funny distributions that exist, uh, Numpy has uh, many, many, many of them, which you can find at the site. For the normal distribution, following their example, which is identical to what uh, ChatGPT told me how to do, if I wish to study a thousand points, which have a mean of one and a standard deviation of 0 0.1, I would generate a list MS uh, by the single call, where I tell it the mean, I tell it the standard deviation, and I tell it how many data points I want. So if I were to uh, go and plot these things in a histogram, this is what I would see. The red line is supposed to be that distribution. This is the theoretical uh, distribution, which uh, the random samples were drawn from. The blue bars represent, uh, if you don't know how a histogram works, how many samples were within this little bed. So as you see, there are different bins of different widths. So between this point in X and that point in X, there are over a hundred of our random samples. But as opposed out here, uh, only about 20 were between these points uh, in M. And if we wish to understand the statistics of our system and what's going on, we might wish to uh, understand what our mean and our standard deviations mean. So here again is this two sigma di difference, and we can see that we're falling, uh, most of our points are falling right within this window as predicted. So let us begin to run these again. If I go back here to our formula, we need to be able to take exponentials. We need to be able to take square roots. Um, and for whatever reason, when Raoul set up this program, he uh, had it define a function, square root, which just calls NumPy's square root function. And we define a function exponential, which calls NumPy's exponential. Good, okay, let me run that cell. <clears throat> and here is the Gaussian distribution that we saw right now. We have our amplitude which is the square root of two pi uh, sigma squared right here. And we have our uh, the argument of our exponential, which is this minus m m naught squared over two sigma squared, and multiply them together and return. So this function will return this, this uh, probability distribution. And then here, 
I will call, uh, oops, sorry. <clears throat> and here I will call this exact same line that I told you before, uh, the number of points in our mean and average. And MS here will print out all the data. So you see, this is a lot of random numbers. Most of them are pretty close to one because one was my mean. And how they're spread out is that plot you were just looking at. <clears throat> and another important thing that you can do within NumPy is save data. Just as how PyPlot had the save fig function, NumPy has a save text function. So what this will do is create a file which contains all of the data that was in this MS list of numbers. So the file name is going to be data.txt, whatever, uh, and you give it the data which you wish to store, some NumPy array. And so this file can then be loaded back into Python uh, in a similar manner with an np.loadText function, which I'll show later. But first, we're going to make our histogram plot. Our histogram plot is quite simple. Uh, you tell it the number of bins you wish to have in your histogram. So if we go again to our plot, there were 25 bins over here. And we said, okay, 25 bins, plot the data. And it makes this blue set of shapes. And then the rest of this is uh, creating the red curve, which the problem is the red curve was originally normalized to something which if you saw over here, it was around 0 0.4. Uh, instead, it's, it needs to be normalized properly to this number of 100. And that's what these formula are taking us through. Uh, so the details of what it's doing here, creating the correct normalization is not important. It eventually gets a function which you're gonna plot, which was the red shape you saw. So if we go and look, here we are. For now, I drew a new random set of numbers compared to this figure I have here. So I have a slightly different shape and it still is more or less in agreement with the red curve, which is exactly our goal. So it is in this manner that you can begin generating uh, <clears throat> these uh, Gaussian random numbers, which are useful within uh, statistical analysis. And finally, as I promised, we wish to load the data. So I need to remember what was the file name we had and then I just call simply load text from that file name. And with the assignment operator, we're going to set in MS2 to be whatever was within that data set. Good. Uh, the final uh, type of figures that I wanted to be able to walk through today were pie charts, because pie charts are a, uh, another classic piece of way to present information. Uh, pie charts are used <clears throat> particularly when you want to show how different uh, contributors add up to the full whole of the problem. For example, a uh, classic version of a pie plot in uh, uh, astrophysics is the energy budget of the universe. <clears throat> As it turns out, the regular kinds of energy and matter that you and I and our computers are made up of only make up about 6% of the total energy of the universe. <clears throat> Instead, most of it is the so-called and quite nebulous dark energy which uh, very little is understood about. And about a quarter of the energy of the universe really comes in the form of dark matter, this sort of missing mass that we see out as we look in the universe. And so by using a pie chart, I can show you how the relative size of these fractions, we are a minuscule piece of what exists out in the universe, apparently. <clears throat> so if I wish to uh, create this pie chart, we would work through first, we need the data to plot. And because I wanted to put legends, I had to uh, create my labels here. And that's what gave us dark energy and uh, all these labels you see out here. And I call simply pyplot.py. And I give it in the first argument, the things that define the actual slices of the circle. And the rest of this is uh, format, making it look nice. Uh, the labels here are fed in again through a keyword argument uh, in the same manner as uh, we wouldn't do before. And then if we wish to make these formattings uh, come out to be a little better, we can add in some extra information. These two center and radius uh, show how the actual size of the plot is it comes out. The uh, fact that these have white lines going in between the slices are what is defined here. It says in between the wedges, we should have a line width of one and a color of white. And this uh, auto PCT thing is what gave it the labels here of the different percentages. Uh, in order to actually get to the numbers onto the plot, as opposed to just showing the wedges themselves. And so if I were to go through and run this same uh, tab in my notebook, this is what you can run. So you can imagine wanting to play with some of the formats, maybe you wanted to make this red instead for some reason. Now there are red lines in between uh, each of the different pieces. And so this is uh, just yet another way in which uh, our 
information can be shared uh, through visualization and through Python is all of these lovely pie plot uh, problems. So uh, here I'm going to pause again for questions, which I uh, think I see one at least in the list there. Ah, great question. Yes, where will the file be saved? <clears throat> the file will be saved in the same directory as your Jupyter notebook is. Um, or if you see in here, um, let me find the file again. So here it's just given a name. It will go to whatever my Jupyter notebook is downloaded or wherever I saved it. And that, that will go there. Or I could have told it a path. So I could have done, you know, user, local, whatever my possible other paths are from the head of my file system is also a option. Though you shouldn't put in user, that would be crazy. Um, <clears throat> but hopefully that uh, answers the question. Are there uh, any more questions on the plotting and things, uh, being able to make these visuals that we've been looking at? Well, um, all right, if there are no more questions about that, or please uh, keep sending them in if there are. Oh, there's one, yes. Ah, uh, yes, how do you define the colors in the pie chart? Um, here, I had it just use the default colors. Uh, so it uh, is just whatever colors Python likes to use. Uh, Python, pretty standard, starts with blue, then does orange, and then does green. Uh, this is just the progression that Python has by default. Um, you could have had a keyword argument that was colors equals something. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what would be needed there. But then there is a colors equals option uh, as well in a keyword, which you would use to set what colors you wish to use. Hopefully uh, that answers your question. Uh, are there any others? Uh, I think there's one in the actual chat. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, you, you ask a very good question. I uh, had only used pie, pie charts on Python for this exact purpose. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how to move this label uh, up. I, there is a way, and I apologize for not knowing it off my hand, uh, off my head. Uh, I believe there are extra arguments you can tell title, uh, the function title here. Uh, you could give it extra arguments, which would tell it uh, things about where its location should be or also about font sizes. For example, uh, you would give it a new argument to change its font size as well. And all of these uh, keyword arguments you can find defined on uh, PyPlot's website, which I will just, uh, hopefully I can pull up and answer at least one of these questions. Uh, so if we go to PyPlot and I uh, try to find in here uh, one of these charts, it will give you all of these different examples. Maybe if I can find colors, here we go. So if you wish to be choosing different colors, the colors have different names. So you would need to give it a list of different colors that were uh, the different rainbows that they have and different levels of transparency. But this website, if you just Google PyPlot and click on these Matplotlib uh, websites, will have explanations of what each of these functions are doing under the lid. Um, yes, uh, yes, they are. And this has to do with um, A, me just copying and pasting them uh, to and from. But as you're saying, this is a little blurry. And it has to do with the size of the plots. If you remember, there is a place to change the fig size. Uh, as you change the fig size and the font sizes of the various things, you will get more and less blurry plots. But it's something that if I'm making a plot for a scientific publication, I spend a lot of time going through and uh, playing with the different parameters. How do I make this in? What font do I want this in? These sort of things to make it look more uh, presentable. Yeah, and if, if you see, my screen is actually zoomed in a lot. If I were to actually uh, zoom back out, uh, this button, 
this is the actual size I see things on. So part of why you see it is I'm just zoomed in, is why it looks blurry. Excellent, thank you, uh, Philip, for getting that documentation. Hard to find things live uh, while searching. If there are um, no more questions on the plotting, at least I have a few more slides to motivate where uh, I was hoping we would go uh, for Friday which is to return ourselves to the problem at hand of projectile motion. Uh, so uh, we can come back to any more questions uh, after that, if you have more still on the plotting. But I have just a few slides to remind ourselves where we started, uh, which is trying to understand ballistic or projectile motion, uh, which is something that humans have been doing for quite a long time, obviously. Um, our most ancient ancestors knew how to throw rocks and spears in such a way that they could hit targets. Um, and in this cartoon, uh, Randall Monroe is um, philosophically thinking about a thought experiment that Newton created when he was uh, first describing his uh, ballistic or uh, laws of motion, which is if you imagine a tall tower and you shot a cannonball forward, the cannonball would eventually go and fall and it would eventually go and fall. But maybe it kept curving around the earth a nice little bit. And eventually you can imagine shooting it so fast that it came back around and hit itself or it's established a stable orbit. This was one of the first ideas of you know, how, what it actually means to be in an orbit. And so as we try to understand these ballistic motions, uh, particularly for rocket science, it become quite important that we can reach this next step so we could uh, hopefully send our rockets elsewhere than on top of ourselves. And, uh, but you can imagine uh, far less dramatic uh, questions of why you care about ballistic motion. Let's imagine you wanted to uh, shoot from this free kick and make a goal. And you want to ask yourselves questions. Uh, how, as the player, do I need to apply force to this ball in order to get into the goal? Now, uh, maybe that's a simple question if there were no players here. You kick it straight and in any basic direction, it'll make its way to the goal. But unfortunately, things are not so simple. Uh, that would be a very boring game to watch someone just kick a single uh, ball into an empty net. Instead, we have obstacles we may wish to consider. So uh, you can ask the questions, is it possible even to shoot the ball over uh, the, or around the obstacles in order to obtain your objective? And this is where uh, Newton's uh, laws of gravity and the second law of motion come back in. So uh, I mentioned before, Newton's law of gravity is uh, tailed in this famous equation that the force between two masses is proportional to their masses times some constant, which uh, was eventually determined experimentally, divided by the distance squared. But if we're near Earth's surface, which uh, most of us are, and we only really care about not a huge range of these distances. So one can imagine replacing R with the radius of the Earth and replacing M with the mass of the Earth and uh, instead simplifying this equation to F equals minus MG, where G is about 10 meters per second squared. So G is the acceleration of any particle near uh, Earth's surface. So if we go back to Newton's second law, which I wrote before was m dx squared uh, dt squared equals uh, f, we can now divide by the m's and we see that our acceleration equals minus g. Now, uh, next week, I believe you will be learning about calculus and in two weeks, you'll be learning about differential equations, but I will uh, jump ahead and say, I know the solution to this differential equation. If I were to throw a ball straight up into the air and then ask about uh, its height as it goes upwards and falls back down towards me, I could calculate the height of that ball at a certain time t uh, is going to be the initial height plus the initial velocity times the time t minus this minus sign being from this minus sign, one half g t squared. So this is the fundamental equation for uh, projectile motion, which we wish to begin asking questions about. For example, uh, you can see this is a quadratic equation. That means there might be two sets of initial positions and velocities that will give me the same final position. So one can imagine I could kick a ball, uh, in order to get the ball, say, right here on this y, you could kick it straight or you could lob it over, or two different ways in which that could occur. And so we will be using uh, this lovely equation and some of the new computational methods we understand in order to find what are the different ways we can kick our balls into our goals and kick our balls around obstacles. And at least that is the objective for Friday. So uh, now uh, here at the end of what was a little bit shorter than I had hoped, uh, 
fortunately, uh, hopefully a relatively interesting talk. And at least, if nothing else, you have learned something about making uh, plots in Python. So uh, are there any uh, potential questions or uh, any other issues you want to bring up or things that I should know for Friday uh, or to bring up before we adjourn? Well, uh, if there is uh, nothing else, I, I will hopefully uh, be uploading these to the Dropbox uh, now-ish, more or less, I'll ask Felipe where to put it. And uh, you will be able to see these notebooks and these slides, and I will do the same uh, for Friday's lectures when we get to it. And please, uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can contact me or uh, Philip or any of the other uh, lovely teachers you've had as part of the uh, Arrays program. And uh, if nothing else, I. Suppose we might want to adjourn. Yes, yes, and thank you, Philip, very much for uh, being able to handle all this. It's quite a lot of work to do some of these things, so uh, so good to have all this support. I suppose if there is uh, nothing more, I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. All right, um, Jeff and Philip, is there anything else we need to uh, do about this? Uh, don't want to keep you any longer than we have to. I don't think so. Very good. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, oh, I think we're good. Oh, good. Perfect. Philip, do you know if you will be uh, the one around helping on Friday? Or... Yeah, I should be here okay, on Friday. Good. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. No problem. Ah, um, <clears throat> I see Alex asked the question here. How does Python use the Jeffrey lab? That's a great, uh, great question. Uh, and I, I can only really say about how Python is used, at least within uh, my work and some of the work of those who I know. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, I, I work in a field of high performance computing uh, where we run on the fastest supercomputers that are publicly available. So in that level, uh, a bunch of our code has to be run in C++ or uh, these very low level programming languages that give you great efficiencies compared to Python. That said, once the computer generates a whole bunch of data, I don't want to have to deal with how complicated C++ is in order to do the analysis. So I do all my data analysis in, in Python. So I'll take in the raw data from the computers, I'll be making plots, studying error bars and trying to um, do uh, fits and regressions of various manners. And all of this is done within Python. Uh, my mind. Um, another way in which it's being used is there's a bunch of people who are interested in machine learning applications. For example, this inverse image problem, there's a lot of people who are um, using Python, I believe, to implement machine learning solutions to this inverse problem and try to uh, determine what is this three-dimensional picture of the proton. They uh, have machine learning algorithms using uh, GANs, whatever GAN stands for, uh, Generative Adversarial Neural Networks, 
in order to try to figure out what information was lost in this. Uh, they're trying to have the uh, neural network learn uh, what information was lost in our experiment, going from our internal degrees of freedom to our external experiment. Um, another way in which it's done is also more data analysis, but on a different scale than what I do. They take uh, global experimental results from colliders in Germany and Switzerland and the US over decades. And they also do huge data analysis problems with those as well. Um, what else? Um, maybe not Python, but Mathematica is used by a lot of the theorists who do complex uh, integrals like the Feynman diagrams I showed. They would use Mathematica there to solve the problems, but I believe there are ways to do algebra like that within Python, but I believe most of them use Mathematica instead. Um, I don't know. I think that's about all I got. Uh, there, there are numbers of uh, ways in which Python could be used. Any program that could be used, of course, uh, and those are at least a few that happen at Jefferson F.
Well, I suppose if there are uh, <clears throat> no more questions, we should uh, break it up then. Very good. Well, if uh, there's nothing else y'all need for me, I'm going to uh, step off. So thank you guys uh, for the help. Okay. And uh, hopefully no one asks questions at this point. <laughs> so see y'all on Friday, I suppose. Sounds good.